Today, the 7-Eleven empire operates more than 60,000 stores worldwide while claiming to have single-handedly invented the so-called convenience store. Oh, that's just hard to believe, because honestly speaking, in the early days, they were the absolute symbol of an inconvenience store, selling only ice cubes. Who does that? But against all odds, the company was able to shake off its frosty image and became one of the biggest retailers in the market. So after all, 7-Eleven is an example of a genius founder and a working business model, right? Well, we will see. And while looking into the company's history, let's make sure to to clarify a few burning and, in parts, pretty weird questions. So, what roles do an Alaskan totem pole, a busy Friday night in the heart of Texas, and a revolution in the coffee serving business play in the story of the 7-Eleven empire? Well, let's find out. Stores called 7-Eleven first popped up back in 1927 when several ice house companies, which primarily sold block ice to households without refrigerators, merged to form the Southland Ice Company in Dallas. Their plan was to continue doing what they were good at, selling ice, and only ice without any intention of selling snacks, drinks, or gas. But that all changed when a Southland Ice employee named John Jefferson Green, now better known by his nickname, Uncle Johnny, came to a shocking but simple revelation. He realized that the company was missing out heavily on a potentially huge market when following the paradigm of selling only one product. He understood that people would be willing to pay for other common shelf products like milk or eggs if they were made available for them conveniently. Is there a convenience store nearby? Through careful observation and a little bit of conversation, John took notice that people didn't have a proper place to buy staple items, especially late at night when all the other stores were closed and had their lights shut off. So Uncle Johnny took matters into his own hands and pitched the idea to his boss, Joe C. Thompson Sr. Thompson realized the potential of John's idea, being able to provide common items like milk or bread, eliminating the need to travel long distances to get them, would save people valuable time and, even more important, money. Making the idea a reality, Thompson began selling John's line of staple grocery products, not only at his own branch, but at other ice store locations as well. They only promise free ice cube. At that time, Southland already had 21 retail ice stores, but when people became accustomed to the convenience these stores offered, that number went all the way up to 60 before the decade was over. But even that success can only be called a humble beginning looking at how history will unfold. In 1928, the customer appeal towards automobiles and, therefore, also fuel to put into car tanks was becoming more common. Southland ice stocks did not miss this trend and began selling gasoline. At first, this was only implemented in the stores located in Dallas, but as the company began realizing that it was a profitable venture, they slowly made it customary among all their stores. Customers also liked that the stores themselves were built 40 to 60 feet behind main roads so they could conveniently pull in and out in their vehicles. No, that's good thinking, I like that. Thompson also drew up some standard characteristics that would become the norm for all stores so that people would receive the same quality and quantity of products everywhere. This was the first effective step towards company standardization. To label themselves as a distinguished brand, he also made it compulsory for employees to wear uniforms. In hindsight, it appears to be the combination of all these little nuances that made the company slowly tilt towards something that began resembling a convenience store. That same year, in 1928, a manager by the name of Jenna Lyra brought home a totem pole as a souvenir from Alaska and placed it in front of his store. The pole served as an effective marketing tool for the company, as it attracted a great deal of attention. Oh, my totem pole! Totem pole! <laughs> it became so popular that executives added totem poles in front of every store and eventually adopted the Alaskan Native-inspired theme for their stores. The stores started to build their entire reputation around this. They began operating under the name Totem Stores and seemed to be doing great by any stretch of the imagination. So it came as a profound shock when in 1931, they filed for bankruptcy.
When Totem Stores filed for bankruptcy, it wasn't for the reason you might think. Not because of the usual poor management or the lack of good business ideas. As we heard before, the ideas they came up with were great and appreciated by their customers. It was the Great Depression that brought economic turmoil and caused many businesses to fail at that time. This is the time of a Great Depression. Totem Stores had to file for bankruptcy and just hope for the best. Nonetheless, the company continued its operations through reorganization and receivership. And by 1933, when the prohibition was revoked, it returned to the market with an even stronger focus on snacks and drinks. This, coupled with strong leadership from the Thompson family, allowed them to make it to the other side of the Depression. In 1946, the company changed its name to 7-Eleven to reflect its new hours of operation, which were, you guessed it, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., which at that time were unprecedented business hours. In the 1950s, 7-Eleven continued to grow, and they not only increased their number of outlets throughout the U.S., but also expanded their inventory to include more grocery items. They began opening stores in every part of Texas, and once they'd exhausted the state, they moved on to Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Florida. I can't believe we're going to Florida. In the 1960s, 7-Eleven began a new initiative to locate and set up convenience stores around every suburban neighborhood. Some places were just too small for traditional supermarkets, but just big enough for a 7-Eleven to fit in. And that's when the company's popularity began to skyrocket. By 1963, they had opened stores in over a thousand different locations. However, while being on a winning streak at that time, they experienced an issue that would redefine the core tenet of the company. One busy Friday night, a 7-Eleven location near the University of Texas got so busy after a football game that the store was forced to stay open past its 11 p.m. closing time to properly serve all customers that had lined up. It turned out to be their most profitable night ever. Realizing how well their sales did that night, the Texas store decided to keep itself open 24-7, permanently. And after executives caught wind of how productive this venture could be, they commissioned other 7-Eleven stores to follow suit and stay open round the clock. All Saturday night around the clock. By 1965, with an established reputation of being open for customers 24 hours a day, it was time for the launch of their most successful product yet, the Slurpee. Seven Eleven invented a sensational semi-frozen beverage that was originally introduced as the Icy in 1965 and later relaunched as the Slurpee drink by 7-Eleven's ad agency. The drink's appeal gave 7-Eleven the opportunity to advertise and promote a product like never before at its 1,500 stores and gave its customers another profound reason to pay them a visit. At the same time, 7-Eleven introduced another wild concept, coffee to go. A revolution at the time, these days, every gas station sells coffee to go, but someone had to start this trend, and it was, in fact, 7-Eleven that pioneered the concept. You're a pioneer. 7-Eleven reached $1 billion in sales by 1971 and became a member of the New York Stock Exchange the following year. Their products, coupled with effective marketing, led to 7-Eleven operating 3,500 stores across the states. They even went international by opening stores in Canada and Mexico. Mexico. The licensing agreements were a success, and by 1974, they had more than 5,000 stores in operation. They continued their rapid international expansion overseas in Japan. Throughout the 70s and 80s, 7-Eleven continued the tradition of self-service convenience by introducing self-serve gasoline. This became common at 7-Eleven locations. Now, you can fill up your tank with gas without needing to be mediated by another person. They also implemented convenient little inventions such as the countertop microwave oven, the self-service soda fountain, and the rolling hot dog grill creating convenient experiences and products such as the Big Gulp Fountain Drink and the Big Bite Hot Dog gave customers unprecedented freedom to grab and go without having to wait for an employee to help them. 
it was the one-stop shop for pretty much everything. And by the 1990s, 7-Eleven had grown worldwide to more than 15,000 stores. Legions of followers worldwide. Following the trend of people spending less time at home, customers' expectations began to change as well. The demand in the market rose for quality, variety, and value being delivered at the same time. So, 7-Eleven established a system that would have fresh food products brought into their shops every day, even on holidays. But despite all the success, the 1990s did prove to be a turbulent time for 7-Eleven, and they had to file for bankruptcy for the second time in now almost 40 years of company history. Already during the high tide of corporate raiders in the 1980s, the Canadian financier Samuel Bellsberg threatened a hostile takeover of 7-Eleven. It's a takeover. Oh, God. Essentially, corporate raiders would buy a huge stake in the company and then use their shareholder rights to introduce measures that would solidify their share value. This would make them the undisputed authority when it came to the management of the business. In a sense, they became the owners. Because of the looming threat of corporate takeover, the Thompson family made some rash decisions that resulted in a precarious financial situation. In an attempt to secure their company by making it private, they performed a leveraged buyout. The members of the Thompson family bought up all the public shares of 7-Eleven so that they could once again have complete autonomy over their company and thereby eliminate the looming threat of a corporate takeover. Well, it's a personal thing. It's a family thing. Many subsidiaries were sold off in order to pay off the heavy debt that resulted from the repurchase of shares. Even so, this wasn't enough to facilitate the costs, and the company went bankrupt for the second time in 1990. It emerged the following year with 70% of its stock owned by Ito Yokado Company, a Japanese retailer, and 7-Eleven Japan, the company's Japanese licensee. Leaving turbulent times behind, and with the company finally under some semblance of control, it continued to do what it does best, proliferate. Over the course of the next decade, growth continued, and 7-Eleven finally managed to claim the magic milestone of opening its 25th thousandth store in 2003. A magic trick? Throughout the duration of the 2000s, customers were provided with value by whatever means possible, and that's how 7-Eleven eventually got where it is today. In 2021, a gigantic $70 million ad campaign was unveiled, which is the biggest they have done in years. The key message of the commercials expressed how 7-Eleven grew as a company and tried to promote its products as something more than just gas station food. They actually believed that they did, in fact, sell restaurant quality food at their outlets. But I think we can leave that up to the customers to decide. Looking back, it's hard to ignore that 7-Eleven is actually behind a lot of things that we take for granted visiting any food or convenience store today. But what are your thoughts on 7-Eleven? Do you still find yourself browsing through the aisles of their stores late at night? Are you a fan of their Slurpee? Let us know in the comments below. If you found this video entertaining or learned something new, please leave a comment and tell us what you'd like to see next. Also, don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell on your way out so you won't miss out on our next inspiring video. Thanks for watching and we hope to see you again soon.